This is Annuity Straight Talk. Since 2008, your host, Brian Anderson, has helped clients nationwide navigate the complex market for annuities. With Brian's assistance, hundreds of clients have achieved a profitable and secure retirement. I would know, because Brian has answered many of my questions concerning annuities and retirement planning. So that you can benefit as well, let's get started. Here's Brian. Hello and welcome everyone to the Annuity Straight Talk podcast, episode number 49. Brian Anderson, founder and creator of Annuity Straight Talk, going solo again today, wearing a cowboy hat because that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and I've got some props, I guess. So I might switch out. We'll see how the story develops over time. I wanted to make this uh, uh, newsletter podcast duo something that people could read as well because I'm just going to kind of tell a story. And again, it's kind of just one of those things about how uh, I bring things together in my own mind and uh, justify what I do and the purpose of doing things like that and cowboy hats and annuities are often misunderstood. I am not a cowboy, uh, but I wear a hat for good reason at times. And it's not at all just to make a statement or to be fashionable. Uh, there's a purpose to it. And that's what I'm going to explain today. So I'm not going to share my screen, but I've got the newsletter up and I'm going to try to follow the story as best I can. So it it kind of rings through or, or, you know, runs through in a nice timely manner. There's going to be things in the newsletter that are not in the podcast and vice versa. Um, but if you want to see some of the pictures, some of the photos, uh, I'm going to try to put a bunch of them in there. It's written now, but by the time you see it, um, on a side note, I want to say happy 4th of July, happy birthday, America. Um, I am recording this on the 4th of July, um, because it seemed like I had a whole weekend of, uh, kind of, relaxing and, and, uh, being as American as I possibly can, uh, smoking brisket, stuff like that. Um, so here it is the 4th of July and we got kind of a, you know, it's a nice day, but it rained a bunch last night. It's supposed to rain again this afternoon. So I thought, why not? I'll, uh, record this podcast and have a story waiting for everybody on Saturday. This will be the 9th of July. I think when everybody sees it. So, um, the story being, uh, you know, cowboy hats and annuities, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I thought, Hey, that'd be kind of a cool story. And again, I've told everybody that every once in a while I want to, uh, you know, do a newsletter or a podcast. It's more of a story. It's not so heavy on technical details. Give everybody a chance to get to know me and kind of understand how I work, why I work this way and you know, why I do it the way I do it. So then I guess, I think this has been good because a lot of people, before they meet me, we'll have seen, you know, a half a dozen uh, videos or something like that. And then they feel like uh, it's easier to make the connection because they kind of understand what I'm about. Now, if you don't like, you know, horses and mountains and hunting and fishing or uh, don't have respect for somebody who does that, then maybe you're not going to give me a call. But I think a lot of people have that sense of adventure inside them. Um, I've always had that. I could probably do a separate story on where that came from. Uh, both my grandfathers were pretty in, inter. Uh, uh, pretty, uh, um, into adventure and doing different things and seeing interesting places. I always like, uh, I've always liked really finding things that other people don't know about it. And that's kind of one of the reasons I'm into annuities is because I discovered a couple of ways that we, they could be used that I thought, man, this is really cool. There needs to be a specialist in this area. So, uh, but I'm going to start back with just, uh, the story part of it. Um, and this is, uh, more than five years ago. I think it was 2016 was the second time I did this with my wife where, uh, we took our second pack trip, horses, mules, uh, into the Teton wilderness in Wyoming. So it's just North of Jackson hole, uh, about 60 miles is where we take off. Um, and it's, it is probably my favorite place I've ever been. Uh, which uh, to me says a lot, not everybody understands this, but I've spent an extensive amounts of time in Alaska, uh, wilderness areas, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Um, and I, you know, I think that's where a lot of the most beautiful places, and that, that's really what I like to see is, is the beautiful places that we have. Uh, we're very blessed as Americans. So I think 
that's one of the reasons of doing this on the 4th of July, Independence Day, is I had a, a client the other day emailed me after the podcast came out on Saturday, you know, just requested some assistance and a couple of ideas. And, uh, and he finished the email by saying, enjoy your uh, 4th of July, you know, weekend, the holiday. It's one of the few things our ever divided country can agree upon. And, and I like that too, because, you know, uh, anybody wants to go back to episode 38, War is a Racket, where I thought, you know, a lot of things are put out there to continually divide us. So the more that we can agree on and enjoy ourselves and feel blessed uh, to be American citizens, uh, the better. And I think this is a great day for it. And I just kind of want to spread that message and share it with everyone that no matter what our political persuasion is, we are all brothers and sisters and we're blessed to be uh, living in this country. And uh, I do not ever take it for granted. And I think about that all the time. So anyhow, so uh, yeah, so we go on this trip in, in Wyoming and it's just the way I explain that trip is it's always, it's like a, you know, it's about 30 miles to our final destination. And so we do it in two days on the way in and, and sometimes one on the way out. And, you know, a lot of times, but the idea is to have fun. We don't need to necessarily work all that hard. Uh, so, you know, you, if you do half of it, I think we did 18 miles the first day and it took us about four and a half hours. And then we do 12 miles the second day. It takes us about, you know, three or so, um, and we get to the spot and then we kind of lay over for a few days. Um, but it's, it's like a 30 mile, 30 miles of pasture and wildflowers. Now I'm not like a big flower guy, uh, where I don't think about it all that often, but I mean, there's no other way to explain it except it's just absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful spot. And there's a point where we ride into this, you know, the ride through this Canyon and down into the final place where we're going to hang out for a few days. And it feels like, you know, this area in the Teton wilderness, this is like, uh, you know, where Teddy Roosevelt used to go hunting. And, um, it feels like because it's, you know, a protected wilderness area right off the Southern boundary of Yellowstone national park. Um, you can't, it feels like you're riding into a piece of American history. I cannot explain the emotional feeling you get when you work that hard and do all that stuff. So, you know, all of that stuff, you know, make it, you know, you get back there and then there's big fish, you catch big fish. Uh, it's beautiful everywhere. Um, and you know, the stock is really happy. The horses and mules, there's green grass everywhere. They get to run around, they get to play. And I take pride in that because I, I realize when I get to places like that, those animals who don't do so much for me, they enjoy it as much as I do. So catching big fish, beautiful places, quiet, not a lot of people, um, and make it well worth the effort to organize the trip and haul it's haul a heavy trailer round trip. It's about a thousand miles. So it's no small task to get everything organized. You think you've got to keep, you know, uh, I'm a master at, uh, cooler maintenance. So we take, you know, we take steaks and roasts and all sorts of, we eat really well when we do it. Uh, but you got to keep that stuff cold. And so it's, you know, it's a two day trip down to get there. Um, really only takes one day to drive, but, um, you know, you get there late at night, you don't start on the trail in the dark. So you usually wait till the next day. And yeah, so you got to keep everything cold and you got to, you got to plan ahead. Uh, lots of different things to do. We had one, one trip, we had, you know, some things go wrong with the truck. It took us time. And so you have to be really organized and, uh, it's got to be well thought out and planned. So it's, it's a lot of effort to do it. Uh, but it's worth every minute of that because it's such an enjoyable experience. So, um, you know, we went in, you know, went into this place and then we had a couple layover days. We take short day rides and all that stuff, um, and go fishing a little bit and just really relax and, and have fun. Um, and you know, by the time we get done, you know, you decide to come home, it's been six days and you, you know, you're taking your baths in the Yellowstone river or thoroughfare Creek, uh, and, you know, you can rinse off and all that stuff, but there's nothing like a hot shower waiting for you at a guest ranch when you come out. It's pretty, uh, it's a pretty cool experience. So, um, we did that trip and we had a really good time and, and the day, and then we drive home and of course we'd come home in a day. And, uh, I got, you know, I got out of, uh, on the way home, I, a friend of mine called me, um, one of my best buddies, uh, the three, the three guys that were my partners in crime in the podcast I did about, you know, uh, leisure time and retirement. We talked about a fishing trip we took a couple months ago. Um, 
he called and said, hey, we're going into the South Fork of the Flathead. That's in the middle of the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And um, we got we got a few things we want to take, and we've only reserved X number of pack animals with an outfitter. So an outfitter was going to take him in. He said, if you want to go, it'd be kind of fun. We've got all the food and everything we need. And, and, and if you could bring a couple animals um, and, and pack a few extra things, we can make the trip really work for us. And so, you know, he's wondering if I want to go. And because it's three of my best buddies and we always have a good time, um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. Sure. Bring your stuff by on Sunday. We'll leave on Monday. Or I think it's Saturday. We left Sunday, something like that. And I had two days to get ready after I got home. And so I thought, well, it's summertime and I got to make the most of it. So anyway, so I, we, they brought all the stuff over and then we all drove down, uh, I think Sunday morning and the outfitter packed all their stuff. I took the extras and loaded up a couple of my mules, brought another buddy. He rode one as well. And we made the trip in, in one day, it was 29 miles one way into that spot. And it's a big mountain pass and a long Valley riding down the hill. Just looking, you can see forever. Um, and it was awesome. We, we made it in at about nine hours, nine and a half, I think. So their plan was to float. They had raft, they had rafts and stuff. Their plan was to float down the river, uh, for a week, but I had obviously my truck and trailer and I had my animals. I had to just ride back out a couple of days later. So I took a layover day, went for a little ride on that day, did some fishing, just hung out and relaxed on the river, let the animals get rested up. And then on the, on the third day at about 7 a.m., I was packed up and I headed back out, uh, doing the 29 miles, the other direction to go home. Right. Um, my horse loves to climb and for whatever reason, when you turn him uphill, he just charges that thing. He's tougher than hell. Uh, he's an awesome horse and that's probably his best quality. Uh, the return trip took me about uh, a little over seven hours. So I, I cruised and made really, really good time. Okay. I said this earlier, I'm not a cowboy, but I wore a cowboy hat both times because of the advantages that come with it. So when you're riding in a, a good straw hat like, hat like this, keeps the sun off my face and the sweat out of my eyes. It's a lot of work. It can be hot. And if you don't have the hat on, you got sweat running down into your eyes and it's just uncomfortable. Okay. Um, one thing hikers, a lot of people call me and said they like to take hikes and stuff like that. What you don't understand is all the trails were cut out for people that are walking that are about, you know, six feet tall, you know, or so. And so when I'm on top of my horse, my head, my head is sitting nine feet high. That means I'm off, often running through brush and, you know, the tops of trees and stuff like that. So continually ducking my head down and the branches run around. So my ears aren't getting scratched. My face isn't getting scratched. Um, you can wear a ball cap to keep the sun out of your eyes, but your ears get dinged up. Your face gets scratched if you go through those those rough pieces uh, of country where you know you're ducking your head through trees. The cowboy hat really really protects you. So uh, cobwebs on the trail are another thing where you know you can see them coming and they're just everybody likes the tall guy riding in front because I take down all the cobwebs. Uh, but you know I can just dip my hat down and the cobwebs hit the hat instead of having them all wrapped around my face and in my eyes and stuff. So but and I guess the you know the one thing that doesn't happen often but does happen is also it keeps a bird from pooping on my head right um so anyway i made that trip out uh with another friend and we made it out in seven and a half hours so it was probably you know 2 30 or three o'clock when we got everything loaded up and headed home which was really great um and so i got you know it was about a two hour drive back home so yeah I call it 5 30 or so and i come home and and my wife was waiting she you know had a couple days by herself she didn't know when i was going to get there so it didn't she was always really good at taking care of me when I came out a long, uh, you know, came back from long trips. There'd always be a good dinner waiting, but she never knew when I was coming back on this one. So rightfully, like I, I told her, like, I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, I will be back on, you know, Monday or Tuesday, whatever the day was. And so she was just uh, laying in the yard, reading a book, uh, getting some sunshine because it was a nice day. And I was dog tired because we'd done, you know, another 29 miles long trip. And, uh, it's, it's funny. I look at these things and I, I could tell like individual stories in the middle of this. Um, you know, there was a couple of things that happened on the trail. Um, you know, anybody that wants to call, if we chat about this, if anybody's interested in the story, I'm going to add, add a few of those details, but kind of like when I talked about guiding in Alaska, the best annuity training possible, that was a really good story about some of the things I did in my younger years. Um, 
so many different things I could talk about, you know, interesting stories. And I kind of save those for one-on-one uh, conversations with people I get to know really well. But anyway, so I was tired. She wasn't ready. And I said, hey, let's just go out to dinner. And there's a really nice restaurant in Whitefish, Montana, that, uh, you know, she really liked it, had good food. And, um, you know, we could go sit at the bar in the lounge and, and uh, you know, just relax and have, have a good dinner. So I thought that was perfect. You know, we decided to go out. So <clears throat> this is where I tell, talk about Whitefish. I don't want to say too many bad things about it, but it's not at all like when I grew up. So it used to be a town that was a pretty tough town. It was full of railroaders and loggers back in the 80s and into the mid 90s. There were always, it's a beautiful area. So there were always a few celebrities or wealthy people there. It's, you know, it's on a lake. It's at the base of a ski hill. It's really nice. Um, and, and those guys were there for, you know, a quiet existence, you know, to get away from everything. Um, and there were always a few of those around. But um, I mean, when I grew up, it was like any other town in Montana. Just the setting was, was pretty amazing. And w- which was different. Um, these days, it's quite a bit different. Everything's going very modern. Uh, I wouldn't even call it modern rustic. It's just modern stuff. And so it's nothing like it used to be where it was a quirky little mountain town. Now it's full of <laughs> yuppies and posers from places like LA and New York. Now, I want to talk a, a, a little bit. There's a lot of people I know there that are out of state from bigger cities that came in. And I don't, I'm not, painting everyone with a broad brush because I've met a lot of really interesting, intelligent people who were successful and enjoyed what Montana had to offer and came out and assimilated to the culture. But there's a lot of people there now. So I'm not talking about everyone because there are some great people there. Um, But I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, you know, the changes that have been made. There are a lot of people that come in and, and I think, you know, several people would recognize this. It's not necessarily, they're not coming here for what Montana is. They're coming for the scenery and they're about, they're pretty much changing it into what they left. And so to me, it's, you know, the crowds are there. It's a different type of people. I mean, I've in the past, you know, year when I've gone out to dinner or something or gone into like a little dive bar to have a burger, uh, I don't recognize anybody in the town, which is, which is different for me because it was always full of, you know, people we knew it was a small community. Um, so uh, yeah, what does it say? Uh, it used to, the town used to have a whole lot more character, but now it's just a hippie modern drinking town with a cool backdrop. That's about what it is. So anyway, I didn't, when we went out to dinner, I didn't change. I'd just been on the trail. Uh, I'd been out for three days and I had dusty boots. You know, I had dirty jeans, a t-shirt and a cowboy hat on. And I thought, I'm not going to shower until I get home. Let's just go out and have dinner. And I'll come back. So we walked into that restaurant and I think everybody looked at me as I didn't know anybody because they're all brand new. They're tourists or uh, new transplants. And I said it was, they looked at me like I was walking into church naked. Like that was so foreign to them to have a guy in a cowboy hat. So scoffs, eye rolls. And I just, I looked at it and I thought, everybody's like, who does this guy think he is? Wyatt Earp. <laughs> and they had no idea. And it didn't, it didn't bother me. It just kind of made me laugh because I knew what, I know what the town was like 30, 35 years ago. And it used to be one of, that would just be one of those things like, oh yeah. So none of them knew that in the previous 10 days, I had covered more than 150 miles on horseback and crossed the two most remote points in the continental United States. The cowboy hats were there for a purpose, not to make a fashion statement. They thought that I probably just got dressed at the ranch store after I got off the airplane and walked in there trying to pretend that I was a hardcore cowboy, which I'm not, it just had a purpose. Right. And so a a little, a a fun fact, if you like trivia is the two most remote points in the lower 48 States. The number one most remote point is Hawks rest in the Teton wilderness, about a mile and a half South of Yellowstone national park boundary. It's near where the thoroughfare and thoroughfare Creek uh, confluence with the yellow, the upper Yellowstone river. Um, and the second most remote point is the confluence of the white river and the South fork of the flathead smack dab in the middle of the Bob Marshall wilderness. Within 10 days, I spent, I crossed both of those points on horseback and, you know, on the, on the second trip into the, into the Bob, 
I remember I made a point of going there just so I could say that. It's like, okay, I went to the first one, went to the second one. So in the most remote point is defined by the furthest uh, point as the crow flies from a developed road that you can drive on. So you have to be deep in a wilderness area to get that far removed from a road. Anyhow, so there's number one, number two. So uh, Hawks Rest and the White River. Uh, if anybody ever asks or you want to, uh, you know, you, you want to have some, uh, you know, some trivia at a dinner conversation and stump someone. So anyhow, um, but it was interesting because I, I, I think that I, they looked at, they looked at me in that restaurant like I should be out of place, but I didn't feel out of place because I was confident in who I was. I feel something similar uh, when people ask me about my business. I think I was in uh, Kentucky about six weeks ago and, you know, hotel bar kind of went down to just relax before I went to bed. And I met some people and I met a guy, a uh, really nice guy. He said, what do you do for a living? And I, I really don't like that question, but I'm not going to see this guy anymore. So, well, I'm in retirement planning and I do all this stuff. And, uh, he's, and you know, he can't ask more questions. Oh, I do safe stuff, you know, retirement, you know, guaranteed conservative investors and all that stuff. And, and, he, and he keeps pushing, pushing. I said, finally, like, hey, I, you know, annuitystraighttalk.com. I, I sell annuities. You know, that's how, that's what I do. And you never know what you're going to get. A lot of people will look at it and be like, ah, it's kind of the same thing where you never know the reaction you're going to get. It's like all those yuppies in the restaurant who had no idea what to do, you know, what they were dealing with. Um, and, you know, so I guess at this point, neither one of them bothers me. I just say it because if somebody's going to have a negative opinion, um, I realize that, you know, I, like how meals are like annuities, like, you know, between mules and annuities, the only people that don't like them are the ones that don't understand them. So it's the same thing here. And I don't, you know, a lot of people say, well, he's not really a financial planner. He's, you know, he's more, he's just an annuity guy. And, um, you know, that, that's interesting to me because obviously to be effective at, at advising on annuities, it has to be in the context of a financial plan. So when you talk about asset allocation, uh, income planning, uh, long-term care, require minimum distributions, taxation. What else does a planner do? I have to do all those things, right? So, uh, you know, anyway, I, I, it doesn't really matter to me because again, I'm confident in what I do and there's a reason why I do the same thing. So it took me a long time to wear a cowboy hat and I didn't ever start doing it until I actually realized what the benefit was. I used to think I put them on and I look stupid. I'm 6'5", I'm a tall guy and this adds six inches to my height, okay? So, Switching props here for the end. Hopefully that came on the right way. I think it feels pretty centered to me. But um, when I realized what a cowboy hat could do for me, that's when uh, I started wearing thinking it's very beneficial. Uh, annuities were the same way. There was a purpose for them, but I didn't really like them because I heard all the negative stuff about them. I started researching them and realized, oh yeah, there is a definite reason why these are applicable to a lot of people, especially in retirement. There wasn't a lot of information out there, so I made it my goal to set up the source for all viable information on annuities and to help people figure out, number one, whether it's the right thing to do, and number two, if it is, then make sure you do it the right way. So... It's very, they're very similar to me in my development or my evolution of thought and why I accepted both as a luxury item, essentially something that makes things a little bit easier. So a good straw cowboy hat, the first one I wore keeps you cool in the hot summer, keeps the sun off you, makes a huge difference. I'm telling you, um, and this thick felt cowboy hat will keep me warm in the winter if I'm riding out in hunting season wear this and it's a nice, uh, cozy insulation for my bald head. Now, another quick story about that is, uh, I don't know, probably seven or eight years ago, hunting with a bunch of friends on the Rocky mountain front. And this is mid November. Uh, there were four of us on the trip, bunch of horses, bunch of mules. And I remember, uh, like on the second night we were in, into this backcountry spot, we got about six inches of snow. And so anybody that's been in the mountains in the wintertime with snow, it realizes that a good powdery snow sits on the branches of the trees. Well, we're riding down the trail. And of course we're ducking through uh, trees. Cause again, we're high. And every time we duck through a tree, a bunch of snow dumps down on, on your coat, right? Well, two of the guys 
didn't have a cowboy hat on. I did. And one of them got, we, you know, we got, you know, a couple miles down the trail, we we're hunting. And he said, I finally understand why you're wearing a cowboy hat. And he was just wearing a stocking cap and he had a jacket with a hood on it. He didn't have the hood on. And every time we ducked through those trees and got snow on us, there was snow was going down the back of his coat. So he was soaked inside. It melted and he was cold. And I thought, eh, another reason why cow, he said, I get it. He said, if I'm going to do this, I got to go get a cowboy hat. Cause that's, you know, essentially, you know, hits my hat and just rolls off the sides and it doesn't dump down my jacket. So, um, anyway, uh, cowboy hats and annuities are luxury items that provide comfort when used in the right situation. It's not something everybody's going to do, but when the situation is appropriate, if you come for a ride with me in Montana, I recommend getting a cheap cowboy hat. Neither one of these are cheap just because I wear them all the time. Uh, they are nice and there's benefit to having uh, a nice and nicer stuff. And everybody knows that there's certain things that, that justify having, uh, you know, spending money on. So for me, the cowboy hat makes sense because it, I use it and it's worthwhile in a lot of different situations. Um, it, uh, again, a luxury item because it, it's, uh, it gives you comfort. So as you head down the retirement trail, one or both will likely make the trip more enjoyable, easier, uh, easier to enjoy. And that's the idea of adding comfort, security, and peace of mind uh, so that the little things don't get in your way. Whatever the condition, whatever the conditions, uh, you're likely going to see some level of protection and uh, peace of mind or security because of doing that. So cowboy hats and annuities, they draw similarities. I wanted to share the story about a couple of my trips and the things that I like to do in the summertime. Um, I have not been out yet because I've been busy and a lot of you guys know why interest rates are up. There's lots of good options and, uh, you know, uh, I need to be there and, and help people when, uh, when they need it. So that's, uh, that's what I've been doing this year, but I think, uh, pretty soon I'll get out and it's time for me to take a few days off. But anyway, if you want to, uh, if you want to chat about it, you can call me at 800-438-5121 or schedule a call on the website, annuitystraighttalk.com top right corner, schedule a call, Pretty simple and easy. Subscribe to YouTube or a podcast, one of your pop or your favorite podcast platform. If you want to be notified when they come out, if you have any questions, comments, respond to the email or give me a ring. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for stopping by on episode 49 and uh, happy 4th of July. I will talk to you next week. Okay. Bye. <music>been listening to annuity stray talk the preceding information is for informational and educational purposes only and does not represent tax legal or investment advice the views expressed by guests on this program are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of annuity stray talk or its partners no information presented today should be acted upon without meeting with a qualified and licensed professional. It is important that you read all insurance contract disclosures carefully before making a purchase decision. Guarantees are based on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the insurance company.